Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, joining us for this Goodfellow um, Symposium. Um, my name is Jill Hall. I'm the manager of rehab at ACC, and I'm delighted um, that ACC is supporting the symposium tonight. We're really keen that this is an interactive session with you and primary care as leaders along with us to support this national initiative about improving outcomes for older people, um, particularly following falls and fractures. And, in, and, and obviously keeping those older people well and independent at home. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Goodfellow unit here in Auckland for hosting us, and in particular my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Shankar Shankaran and <laughs> Professor Nari Kurs, who are going to lead you through um, the presentation and the uh, rest of the symposium. I'll hand over to Shankar. Thank you, Jill. Um, what I want to do along with Jill is just to uh, go through uh, setting the um, scene presentation, really. Um, so the first slide is um, just going through the national program. Uh, this is a cross-sector program we are doing. This is uh, from ACC, the Ministry of Health and the Health Quality and Safety Commission. Uh, this is in partnership with the DHBs um, and also the PHOs uh, as well. So as you can see, um, this is uh, improving falls and fracture service outcomes for older people. And this is to introduce Muriel. Uh, Muriel is your patient and if you want to keep Muriel at home, well, preventing falls and not landing up in the hospital with fractures, especially hip fractures. And that's what this program is about. Um, the next slide is um, just a very sort of simple presentation on what this program is about. So there are three uh, components in here. The first component is the uh, hip fracture. So what we are doing um, as a trans Tasman initiative is organizing an initiative called uh, Australian New Zealand Hip Fracture Registry, which is mainly to improve care for hip fracture patients in New Zealand. Uh, why hip fracture? Hip fracture is... Uh, a huge thing for an older person. They come into the hospital and 25% of the patients can die within a year. And this initiative is to look at how we can improve the outcomes for hip fracture patients. And the second um, in the triangle is about the fracture liaison services. So what we want to do is um, uh, capture patients who have had a fragility fracture uh, and then look at how we can actively uh, pursue treatment uh, for osteoporosis to prevent further fractures for these patients. And then the green bit is about the um, falls risk assessment, which we want you to be uh, keenly involved and also referring patients to uh, exercise programs, which we'll come and talk about. Next slide. So the hip fracture care standards, um, uh, we've got seven standards which we've organized. Uh, I don't really want to go through all of these in detail. Um, you can see them um, in the slide. Um, and the most of them are mainly hospital based, but the most important part for primary care is when a patient comes in with a hip fracture, we just need to be looking at how we can actually uh, start them on osteoporosis medications to prevent the next fracture. Um, and what we are trying to do from the hospital is start these patients on this phosphonate medications. But if they don't get started, we would like the primary care uh, physicians to start these patients on medications for um, to prevent these fractures. So, but these standards um, will be published, and we'll come back and talk about uh, uh, in the end about how we are going to do it. Go on to the next slide. Um, Jill, do you want to talk about this service courage um, slide? Yes, yeah, so over the, over the coming months, you, across the country, you'll start to see um, more and more services coming on, online. And those will either be uh, starting new services around fracture liaison or in-home in community strength and balance programs or community groups uh, strength and balance programs. Um, some of these will be new. Some of them will be ramping up existing programs to actually reach more and more older New Zealanders. Um, the slides are a wee bit busy, but it's just to, to try, try and illustrate that um, this is a national program and there are programs being established or uh, um, uh, encouraged to develop in your area. So the uh, next uh, bit is about the fracture liaison services. So all the DHBs uh, should have fracture liaison services in place now. And what we've done uh, with 
um, uh, sponsorship from Osteoporosis New Zealand. We've organized uh, clinical standards for fracture liaison services. And this is about identifying a patient who has had a fragility fracture over the age of 50, and then investigate these patients with appropriate investigations like a bone density scan to assess the osteoporosis and then providing information to these patients uh, and also uh, to the general practitioners about um, the importance of starting treatment for these patients. Um, and then starting them on this phosphonate. So um, you will be getting letters from the factual liaison service coordinators uh, who assist these patients either from primary care or from secondary care, and then asking you to start these patients on bisphosphonate medications to treat osteoporosis. And the standard five is the integration, how we can integrate with you better uh, through with the primary care health professionals, and then also having a quality mechanism about how uh, doing audits to make sure these services are working well. So these fracture liaison services should be in place with all the district health boards and uh, uh, information um, you know, should be available for you. Uh, the strength and balance programs, uh, once again, Jill will be talking about it very briefly about what they're about. So it, it, importantly, as part of fracture prevention, um, critical part of that is force prevention. Um, and in order to um, uh, meet the uh, increasing sort of uh, demand that, that is going to be placed on the health system, around uh, the incidence and prevalence of falls, we're, we're trying to, um, as I said before, grow, the, grow access to both in-home strength and balance programs and community-based group strength and balance. Um, what you'll see uh, around your area is a, um, the Live Stronger for Longer brand, which is a unifying brand that is uh, unifying for consumers to be able to recognise and also yourselves recognise um, programmes that do uh, uh, provide an effective strength and balance programme. So when you see the tick or you pick a programme with a tick, um, those will be approved programmes that meet quality standards based on, on the evidence of what, what um, makes a good exercise programme. And you can find out where the programmes are in your area and a key contact in your area is what we call a lead agency who's coordinating access to classes. And that's on the Live Stronger for Longer uh, website. So this uh, slide is just to give you um, an example of what the DHB is doing. So this is Kanti Spanakal uh, DHB, and we are using uh, simple resources which have been developed through the um, Health Quality Safety Commission through the Reducing Harm from Falls program. So this is uh, um, your receptionist could be giving the uh, patients over the age of uh, 75 a ring and asking them, have they had a fall within the last year? Um, have they got any difficulty getting uh, out of a chair? Um, and also, have they had any difficulty uh, doing normal activities, have any fear of falling? Uh, and if the answer is yes to any one of these three questions, then doing a couple of simple tests, which is uh, a timed up and go test, uh, which takes only a couple of minutes to do, um, and also a four stage balance test, a tandem test. And all these resources are available in, in the Live Stronger website and also in the Health Quality Safety Commission website as well. So these are very um, simple tests to do. And then acting on this, if the tests are positive, and then referring them on to a community uh, based group program or in home program. So, this is the model counties is doing, and all the DHB should be doing a similar model uh, to prevent falls in older people. So, this is the national outcomes uh, dashboard, and Jim will be talking about this. So, this just represents one of the uh, indicators that we're using um, in a national outcomes framework which will guide practice and quality. Uh, improvement across uh, New Zealand. There are a range of indicators that will be reported both at a national level but also at a DHB district level. Um, so you'll be able to see the benefit of these um, uh, community-based interventions over, over time. And we'll have an, a, 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 a interactive dashboard available at the end of October, um, but, which can be also linked by the Live Stronger uh, website. 
And this is the website resources. Um, Jill, do you want to go through this? Yes, so there's a whole range of resources that have been refreshed um, and linked into this uh, single brand, Live Stronger for Longer. And as I said before, this is a unifying brand for consumers, for older people, to connect into these programs and services that help them stay independent and well at home. And one of the frequent um, or previously very successful brochures, Standing Up to Falls, uh, which is often uh, handed out in, in uh, GP practices, is now uh, the, the Love Your Independence brochure. All of these resources, including posters that can be used in your practice in your area, are available on the Live Stronger uh, website, as well as links to the osteoporosis guidelines um, and other supporting material for, for health providers. So the key messages uh, from the short presentation, you know, looking at the whole of systems approach for falls and tragedy fracture prevention in older people, is um, I think the most important thing is that when a fragility fracture is identified um, by the fracture layers on services or by yourself, the important message is to treat them with appropriate medications. Uh, so we are talking about bisphosphonates. And uh, the over 75 year olds, uh, these medications are available uh, without uh, burn density scan. So uh, you can start these patients on medications without doing a uh, DEXA scan. The second take home message is identifying false risk. So um, it is a very simple uh, test to do, either doing a timed up and go test or if a patient has got difficulty getting out of a chair, uh, then these patients should be referred to the either the community-based group uh, exercise programs or the in-home programs. And then the third message is that um, uh, you should be able to connect uh, with your local falls pathway. And each DHB has got a local falls working group and uh, we would like you to connect with them to look at what programs are offered for uh, these patients in your DHB. Now, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, pass it on to Mary now. Mary will be going through the cases and then we'll have a discussion about these cases. Yep, that's right. I'm going to quiz uh, both Jill and Shanko here about uh, what to do, whereas actually I think all you guys out there know just about <clears throat> as well as us what to do. Now, this is just a reminder for you to ask your questions. We haven't got any questions on the screen yet, but uh, we will be looking out for them. Okay, next slide. So our cases. First, we have to acknowledge Tana Fishman here. Tana is a GP in South Auckland, and she. these cases are all patients of hers. They were actually, uh, they're on the video, if any of you have watched the, watched the video that's um, advertising the webinar, but they were at the launch of this program in, in Counties Manukau. So the first one here is Josie, and Josie is 81, and she lives alone. Her granddaughter was moving, and so she came on over there to help her clean out the house and do all the things that you do for your granddaughters. And um, Josie just describes getting text messages or watching text messages come in to her granddaughter, reminding the granddaughter that Nan should not be climbing up on things and Nan should be uh, not be do overdoing it. So anyway, Nan went over there and overdid it anyway. Um, she was helping her daughters bring the curtains down and she was pulling a wire out of a curtain and over she went. She describes it just as uh, it happened uh, when you least, it happens when you least expect it. Now, um, Josie was lucky. There were no injuries. She hopped up, felt a bit silly. Her granddaughters all looked uh, fussed around and looked after her. She didn't enjoy that. Um, and she uh, came along to the opening to talk about having had a fall. Now, Josie is fairly well. She walks a lot. She takes medications for blood pressure and um, not much else, really. So now I'm going to ask you two. So, Shankar, what do you think? What caused her fall? And should we stop her climbing up on chairs? Well, this, this lady is very active, as you okay. said, Nari. And um, I think this was an accidental fall, mm -hmm. uh, really. And I think the most important reason for the fall is that as you grow older, um, the balance um, goes down in older people. That's physiology of aging. Um, so um, it's, and also if you take multiple medications and if you're taking a blood pressure medication, that can cause partial hypotension, so that can be a risk factor for the fall as well. So um, 
so those uh, risk factors need to be considered. Uh, but I wouldn't stop this patient from doing activities. I think we yeah. should be encouraging activities for this older person who is very well. So yeah. uh, that's what the answer is. Yeah, yeah. I know. I totally agree with you. Um, so nobody quite knows why, ha why falls happen. It's a complex mix of a whole lot of things. So let's talk about what we can do to prevent the next fall happening. And I think, Jill, you might have some good news for us with these falls, uh, with these uh, balance and strength programs, which are going to be available throughout New Zealand, funded by ACC. Sure, and I think I think as um, both Shankar and Nairi said, if, if balance or strength are an issue, then it's really important to get um, your older person referred straight into a, a strength and balance program. And if they can get to a community class, there's lots of advantages to doing that. Um, so across the country, we are supporting uh, lead agencies to grow access to programs. Um, so more and more programs should be uh, becoming available uh, across the country. And it's again, look out for the Live Strong, the branding and the, and the tech. So we're really, really delighted that ACC is supporting this. But of course, it doesn't let you in primary care off the hook because um, Shankar, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree, all of the usual things that you do looking after your older people are even more important as frailty becomes a little bit more of a problem. So taking the holistic approach, review the medications. As uh, somebody, when I was in medical school, they were saying, if you haven't, if you, you probably have poisoned that person and made them fall over until proven otherwise. So always review the medications as you would be doing whenever you write the prescriptions for the older person. Have a look at their congestive heart failure and their other medical problems and make sure that things are optimally managed as well as they can be. It is recommended in the in the guidelines to do a, a balance assessment, so such as a timed up and go. And that's quite simple. I know most GPs actually do that as they're walking down the hall with the patient on the way from the waiting room. So just obser simply observing the gate is quite easy to see when things are not as they should be. And I heard somebody say, keep her life expanded. I think it was Bruce Errol, actually. So stopping activities is perhaps a retrograde stance for a lady like Josie, who's really quite active out and walking. Okay, so now we'd like to, uh, any more comments from Shankar or Jill, and then we'll have a look at the questions you're sending in. Well, I think the important thing, Dara, you mentioned about the medication review, and I think that there is a new thing which is going on, de-prescribing, you know, over 80 year olds, we just need to be looking at the unwanted medications, like aspirin is a very common medication which is prescribed for a long-standing hypertension, but there is no evidence for primary prevention for aspirin um, in over 80 year olds. So, Think about deep prescribing, think about stopping unwanted medications like aspirins and statins and all those things, which are not proven to be effective in over 80 year olds, and uh, there is not much evidence. Well, now that's another topic for another yeah, webinar, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, we just like to uh, have a couple of questions. There was one here What do you think about soft hip protectors? Now, I think that's a really, really good question. Yeah. Hip protectors uh, were very popular and they've sort of gone off the boil, but that is mostly because like condoms hip protectors only work if they're on yep. so leave them in the drawer and you're in trouble um and hip protectors some people are a little bit self-conscious and don't like to see the bulge so there are hard hip protectors and soft hip protectors my understanding is that they are as good as each other is that what you yeah. think I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, the compliance is an issue and I think there have been plenty of studies on it. Maybe uh, compliance is a bit more in the residential case sector, yes. uh, but not in the community dwelling patients. Yes. Uh, so I think that needs to be, uh, um, you know, taken into account. Uh, but certainly if somebody has got multiple falls, the most important thing is to look at how we can refer them on to exercise programs, as we yes. talked about. Yes. But if somebody is falling with all these interventions yes. put in place, then you should be considering the protectors. You know, we need protection. to be looking at reducing yep. harm from, yep. you know, from these falls. So that should be considered. So that's a good question. And definitely in residential aged care where people are there to assist putting them on and off. Now, there's a question here, which Jill, you can clarify. Will ACC fund these programs if there has been a fall without injury and therefore no ACC 45? Good um, question. So just, just to be to, to be absolutely clear, ACC is making a contribution to support 
the growth and access to community group programs and we're, we're making a contribution also to in-home strength and balance and fracture liaison where the services um, are, are able to be developed further. The community class programs, we're not directly funding the programs. These are often community led gold coin donation mm -hmm. type programs. And that's what uh, we believe as, a, as, as um, a, a nation actually will be the best way in order to sustain those programs. So it's really important to know that any person who's at risk of a fall where you perceive uh, the risk to be related to strength or balance that they refer to these programs it doesn't take it doesn't take away from addressing those other other issues that that Nairi and Shankar mentioned that may be contributing but if there's a strength and balance problem then they need to get to a, a, a community class or an in-home program that's where the evidence um, of most uh, benefit and effect is yes well and and let's face it um the mobility problem is the strongest risk factor. Now, quite a few other um, questions here about people with dementia. Now, that is a very good topic. Mm -hmm. How will people with dementia and some and one uh, person here uh, has talked about contracting a physio into the local rest home? Um, and the question they'd love to hear about in particular is about the patient with dementia. So. Yes, um, people with dementia, it is harder to prevent falls and it is harder to engage people with dementia in exercise classes. It is quite possible for people with dementia to participate. They need to be supported and they need to rather follow along and copy rather than be given a set of exercises to practice at home. There's been quite a lot of research and not many trials have proven that uh, people with dementia can uh, be successfully uh, engaged in falls prevention, but I do believe that the research is yet to come that will show that if exercise and strength and balance can be delivered to people with dementia, which means supporting, which means mimicking and copying rather than um, having to learn the exercises, that it will be successful. People with dementia, of course, have many other challenges. It is much easier for them to be confused. Their environment sometimes confuses them. For instance, agitation about going to the toilet can um, cause a fall because they run into things and forget just where they're going. So being aware of a very holistic approach is, is very important. Yeah. What do you think, Shankar? I totally agree with you. I think there is not much evidence, as you yeah. said, Nari. Um, and also, it is difficult to engage these patients in the exercise programs in the community. Uh -huh. So I think we just need to wait for more evidence. But if the exercises can be provided and supervised by the caregiver or the families, yeah. then there is no harm in providing them. I think we need to have that supervision. Yeah. But there is not much evidence available at the present time. We need to wait for it. OK, great. Well, should we have a look at the next case? So the next case is Bernadette, and Bernadette is also 80 and lives alone, and um, she was in bed one day and she just rolled over and rolled out of bed, and it just happened like that. Bernadette was injured with this uh, fall out of bed and uh, did have a cut on her forehead. She also talked at length um, about another fall that she had when she was carrying her washing basket around was trying to carry the washer basket into the house and tripped over on the step and over she went. Now she, unlike um, unlike our pro, uh, Josie, who was our prior case, um, was unable to get up and so she ended up crawling into the living room where she was able to climb on the couch. Now, <clears throat> and had to wait quite some time for somebody to come and rescue her. Now she, unlike Josie, has multimorbidity and polypharmacy. Um, and ha does have significant trouble getting up from a chair. In fact, Bernadette has trouble getting out of the house. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit more about Bernadette. Yeah. So you can see Bernadette's a bit less able. How was this patient different to the first one, Shanka? Well, she is a much more frail patient. No other patient that we talked about was a you know able patient. You know who was very active. Um, didn't have multiple comorbidities, only had hypertension, only on a single medication, but this patient had multiple medications, uh, Bernadette. And so she will come under the, you know, the frail um, 
age mm-hmm. frail group. And so this is a patient you know, who would need uh, the interventions, what we talked about, medication review, maybe an occupational therapy assessment to look at the home environment to avoid um, you know, falls at home. And she will be the ideal patient for an in-home exercise program where mm-hmm. it is administered by a trained physiotherapist um, under the supervision of a physiotherapist and the home care providers uh, supervising the program as well. So we are able to provide that. And do, do you want to make some comments on that? Yes, just re- re- reiterate. So if this lady isn't able to get out of a chair without using her hands and you consider that to be a, a strength and balance issue and she's unable to get out to a community class, then she will benefit from an in-home program. Um, and those in-home programs will be also available um, for you to refer into. Uh, yes, now I'm, I know somebody's going to ask this, so I'm going to preempt it. Can they deliver to people in rest homes and private hospitals? So the the, the purpose of, of these interventions is that they are based on the evidence around population-based interventions. And we know that in the rest home situation, um, as you've described, it, it's very much uh, has to be targeted at, at a, a individual case basis, a one-on-one basis. But we know the application of at a population level of the in-home program based on the Otago exercise program will work at a population level for those people without with a strength and balance problem. How does it? Because GPs deal with individuals. But anyway, um, so <laughs> we're um, so there's definite possibilities for Bernadette for the in-home program, and I'll just return to one of the questions because it did reiterate. This is, sounds like quite a complex uh, situation of a man in a rest home, and it sounds like everybody's doing everything they can for him. He's having some strength and balance retraining. He's had his medication reviewed. He, he's being as active as possible. They've got um, some sensors for when he gets in and out of bed. But he has quite advanced dementia and is quite frail, can stand by himself. And so, of course, he walks without his walker, uh, forgetting to take it with him. Um, now, this is quite common in residential yes. care, isn't it, mm. Shankar? Mm. Do we have any special answers for that one? Well, we talked about that before, and I think this yeah. would be a patient for considering hip protectors. Hip protectors? Yes. Very good idea for yes. protection. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's a difficult problem, you know. I think you know we we are looking at all the interventions. What we talked about, Nari providing mm. sensor mats and yep. all those things need to be done. But ideal patient for a hip protector. I would think. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. And also, I think you just have to balance the risk against the benefit. This poor chap, you know, mobility is part of our autonomy, and mobility is part of our quality of life, and so. We don't tie people down anymore and we don't tie them into bed and restraining people is no longer an option and I think that's a good thing. And so for this chap, accompanying him whenever you can, keeping him as active as possible and really pushing on those strength and balance and he may well um, just get a little bit better. Now here's another good one. What about coli calciferol in falls prevention? That's vitamin D, (laughs) vitamin D. Well, this is another good topic for ACC. That's right. <laughs> and I think, you know, the, the evidence is that vitamin D should be used for um, patients, you know, who are homebound. Yes. So certainly we would recommend patients for residential care yep. patients. And also patients who are in the community who don't really go out much in the sun. What about Bernadette? Um, Bernadette, well, she would come under the frailty age group. And yes, I think she, she is yep. not going out much. Yes, uh, So right. I think she would be a good candidate mm-hmm. for Mm. So I think certainly the, the SEC has been um, doing this initiative, you know, providing um, vitamin D prescription yep. for yep. older people in residential care. And I think most of the residential care in the DHPs are doing very well. And I think yeah. we would like the percentage to be more than 75% as a target. Um, um, so that's in residential care. In residential yeah, care. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I think patients who are uh, in the community, but uh, mm. if they are not going out much, and I think they should be considered for vitamin D. Yep. And also right. people who, you know, covered themselves, you know, and also people with brown skin. Um, yes. And also, you know, covered veil and other, you know, fully clothed patients should be considered for vitamin D as well. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Now, there's one more question about, now, would we give Bernadette a bisphosphonate? That was my question. And then I'll go to the 
participants with yes them. so i think certainly what i would be recommending is that you know we just need to go through that osteoporosis guidance okay and, um you know if you look at it you can actually do um a risk assessment using yep. a FRAX risk assessment. Yeah. So I presume whether it hasn't had a fracture yet. Fragility no, fracture. not that we know of. So we don't know. So I think we could probably use that osteoporosis guidance. Yes. Doing the FRAX or the Garvin, which is there. So yep. looking at, you know, if the hip fracture risk is more than, you know, 10%, then yep. this patient should be commenced on bisphosphonates. And, and it's clearly given in the osteoporosis guidance. Does she need a DEXA to get bisphosphonates? Um, no, we don't need to. She's always seventy-five. So, okay. so okay. FIMAP criteria is very clear. So, if they are over seventy-five, and then if you go through the guidance, if they've had a fragility fracture, or if you've gone through the Garvin or the FRAS yep. assessment, and they're higher than ten percent, higher than ten percent, then you know they should be commenced on bisphosphonate. So you don't need to do an extra scan for these patients. Great. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question. Um, with bisphosphonates, there was some research which suggested that they work for a period of time and then stop working. Well, what what we are saying is that we we are recommending a drug holiday. So, ah, so okay. again, it is industrial process guidance. So, if somebody has been commenced on bisphosphonates after four to five years, if they're doing very well, if they haven't had any fracture, then you can consider a drug holiday for two years. Uh -huh. um, it is in that guidance. Um, and then, you know, you might want to do a bone density scan after two years to assess the bone density. And then if the bone density is falling, then you can commence this again. Patients. And how long should the first period of bisphosphonate be? Four to five years. Four to five years. Four to five so years. once they're on it, they're on it for four to five years. Yep. Drug holiday with a DEXA and then a DEXA again. Yes. Okay, right. great. Yeah. And it is all very clear in the osteoporosis guidance. Okay. So it is in the your you know pathway, you know, if you've got to your pathways in your DHB, yeah. It is in the pathway. So it's all very clearly written down. It is not an 80 page guideline, it is just a one page guideline, very clearly um, telling not you. Not 80 to do. pages, no. thank goodness. No. <laughs> They've Australia. They were okay. 80 page guidelines. <laughs> um okay, so Another question here, which um, uh, which is is whether we can give Fosamax under ACC. Now, it's not necessary because Fosamax is fully funded under the public program as long as the osteoporosis guidelines are used in the yeah. prescribing. And if someone's had a fragility fracture, fracture, then they're automatically eligible. So I think well, the, the only thing to add is that for under 75 so for over 75 if they've had a fragility fracture you can use the pharma criteria to start with phosphorus but if they are under 75 yes acc funds these uh, ah. kind of bone density scans so okay once again it is in the osteoporosis guidance okay so you can actually um get an excess scan done under acc acc okay, so how, fund how do you organize it so Joe, we're going to ask you this yeah, yeah. so the yeah. um as Shankar said, it's very clearly written in the one page guideline that where there is an ACC covered claim for a fragility fracture, ACC will cover the cost of the DEXA scan and its referral via the fracture pathway within your area from a uh, suitably vocationally trained specialist. The criteria, is that a GP? Uh, no, yeah, a vocational uh, registered GP could do it as well. Okay. It's, the, the criteria are outlined in the guideline. Okay, okay. okay, good. Uh, boy, the questions are pouring in. This is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, okay, so can you comment, please, on the treatment of osteoporosis in patients with age-related renal impairment? Good question. Are bisphosphonates considered toxic enough that we should be calculating actual GFR in frail patients before prescribing? And can you comment on alternatives, please? Yep. Once again, it is in the guidance. Um, so if the creatinine clearance is less than 30 mils per minute, then you cannot give intravenous zoledronic acid. It's absolutely okay. contraindicated. Yeah. Um, if you know for or bisphosphonates, what we are recommending is that you need to reduce the frequency of administering bisphosphonates. Normally, it is given weekly uh, for a normal patient with a normal creatinine or normal GFR, eGFR. But if the eGFR is reduced, you might want to look at uh, reducing it to fortnightly. Yeah. And that is a recommendation we are giving as a specialist. So okay. if somebody has got renal impairment less than 35 mils per minute, I would make it fortnightly or even monthly. And that okay. is what I would be trying. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Well, should we have a look at the next case because it's yeah. quite topical, mm. having all the questions about um, osteoporosis? Because this is Jan.
and Jan was walking outside her house and she was just stepping down a step and she kind of slipped and jolted and um, she talks about this at some length um, in the in the in the video but she immediately felt severe pain in her back and uh, after a period of everybody being confused, including the GP, there was a, a X-ray done, and she had a thoracic spine uh, compression fracture. And then a few weeks later, she just simply um, had a bit of a trip and sat down heavily, and had another fragility fracture with a um, compression fracture. So her main problem. For 18 months, that's a very long time, was pain. So she talked about that quite a lot and how hard that was to get through. So let me just ask you, Shankar. Yeah. So what do you mean by a fragility fracture? What is that? <laughs> well, fragility fracture is uh, um, uh, a fracture as a result of a fall less than one meter height. So that is what a fragility fracture is. Okay. We're not looking at a patient, you know, who's had a you know, sort of uh, getting off you know, on a ladder and then coming from the ladder and having a fall up, that is not a fragility fracture. So it is less than one meter height. If uh, somebody gets a fracture because of it, mm -hmm. then that is a fragility fracture. That is okay. a definition. Of and so it can be the spine? Yeah. It can be the wrist? Yes, it can be the hip. It can be the hip? hip. It can okay. be the humerus. Okay. Like the proximal humerus. So okay. all these. So, so the most common sites of fragility fracture is the spine, yeah. the hip, the wrist, the humerus, okay. and pelvic fractures. So it's a pelvic fractures. So less than a meter, so from standing height. Actually. Standing height. Okay. Yeah. So, so that when you and I fracture. fall over, we don't fracture. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we're doing a lot of exercise. Well, I hope so. Where are you? <laughs> I'm not saying how old I am. Um, now, when somebody has a fracture like that from seemingly minimal trauma, should we be worrying about any more sinister things? Well, I would be doing simple baseline investigations like, mm -hmm. um, you know, a serum calcium level and the normal blood tests. If they're all normal, then you don't need to worry about what we call as a pathological fracture. Okay. So, you know, if they've got other symptoms, if they've got weight loss, if they've got cough, and if they've got lung symptoms, then you should be worried about. Or if the they primary... have a history of bowel cancer or breast cancer yeah, in the exactly. past. Mm -hmm. So I think if there are other warning symptoms, then you need to be worried about, you know, other causes. But. If somebody gets a fracture from a standing height, and then if all the blood tests and there are no other symptoms, then it would be a fragility fracture. And how you manage that would be managing the pain. Uh, yep. Most of these fragility fractures, once the fracture heals, the pain disappears, you know, which might okay. take about three to six months, but the pain goes away. Yeah. But there is a small percentage of patients, probably about five to 10% of the patients might have chronic pain from osteoporosis. And that is what Jan had. She had. Yeah. yeah. So I think that needs to be managed. And I think we need to be looking at using the pain ladder, obviously using yes. paracetamol. Yes. Um, and as a geriatrician, I don't like using tramadol and codeine and, yes. um, you know, those medications, which have got a lot of side effects in the older people. So what I normally do is I use paracetamol and then go on to a stronger painkillers like a morphine derivative, we like morphine or oxycodone or oxycontin, and that is what I would be using in the short term. And then once the pain disappears after the healing, you obviously need to address the um, osteoporosis, you know, use, uh, yes. and that is what the fracture liaison service is about. So if this patient, you know, comes to the hospital or the fracture liaison service will be proactively picking these patients up and then yes. recommending treatment to the GPs to commence osteoporosis yes. uh, treatment with bisphosphonates. So that okay. would be a key thing from this case. Okay, so how, how do I find my fracture liaison person? <laughs> well, the fracture liaison services operate um, in all the DHBs now. Yes, some actually are uh, yeah. hosted out of primary care, and really um, many of them will be sending referral letters or recommendation letters out to, out to GPs. And we're really looking for GPs to act on those recommendations and advice around prescribing bisphosphonates. It's actually the bisphosphonates and force prevention that will prevent the second fracture. And, and that's what we're trying to address at scale across the country. Yeah. OK, great. Well, there's some good questions rolling in here. So uh, just going back to hip protectors briefly, where can we get them and are they funded? Now, my understanding is that they're not funded. Yeah. 
Yeah. They're not funded. Yeah. Yeah. So patients need to pay for it. Will I ACC pay for it? I'm just asking. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, our, 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 prior, our priority. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's really important that um, one of the key messages here that we have to look at where the most effective interventions are. And the most effective interventions are around exercise and particular strength and balance, um, either in home or in classes and the bisphosphonate prescribing. And in order to reach the number of people that we need to reach over the, the next few years to prevent falls and fractures, it's those population-based interventions that we need to, to really focus on. Um, it doesn't take away from individual interventions and a case-by-case -case basis, hip protectors may be really useful. Um, but at, a, at, a, at scale, at a population level, it's actually exercise and bisphosphonates that are going to make the difference. For yeah. secondary fracture prevention. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, so there's some good questions rolling in about the exercise. Um, so good question is, is how do we get everybody in the whole population going yeah. so that we don't need falls prevention later on? Now that's a different public health question, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it is. But um, I mean, I suppose our focus is is initially on those people at risk. But we all have a responsibility to advise and support um, people turning 65 to stay active, to, to stay physically well. And certainly, if they are at risk of falling, get them into these class uh, community class programs that are absolutely targeting falls risk. So yet the idea is that we um, really get into to, into primary prevention. Um, but we have to start with those at risk first. And I think my view is that uh, we should be looking at green prescription programs. Yes, green programs. prescription is still active and working. Yes, so I think that is what well. we should be thinking about. You know, like my vision for older New Zealand is that, you know, like we should be seeing more older patients in the gym. I go to the gym on a regular basis. Yes. And I don't see many older people in there. Yes. And I think we should be seeing more. Yes. Um, I think certainly what we are trying to do with this program is that, you know, we are graduating patients you know, who have finished the in-home program, they are better, hooking them onto the community programs. Yeah. And then once they finish their two-month community exercise programs, then they should be hooked on to the lean prescription programs. Yes. And that is what we are trying to do. So these, these uh, local lead providers We'll be linking them with the prescription programs as well. Okay, so that is great. what we're trying to do. Or to general or just to general exercise programs in their community. Yes. Yeah. So the you know, we, we don't want to stop sixty five year olds from mountain biking if they are if they want to. If, if they yeah. stay yes. doing that, let's keep people active. Yes. Um, but let's target those that are at risk with interventions that we know will, will work at scale. Now, there's a question about the process of the ACC9 criteria recommendations for the exercise programs. How does that work? So those criteria are based on their technical implementation criteria, if you like, based on the research evidence. A group of experts around New Zealand, including, including me, <laughs> Nairi, um, we're involved in interpreting, in interpreting the evidence and applying uh, or creating these criteria that are it basically affecting this criteria. So the lead agencies will work with community providers, whether it's age concern, the local gym or um, the local Zumba class to make sure that those classes um, achieve those effectiveness criteria. They'll be then given the uh, strength and balance tick and you'll know that those programs are effective at um, reducing falls risk through addressing strength and balance issues. And so um, ACC will accredit them, if you like, and so, so then we all know that they're good. Yeah. So we're we're not we're not we're not, oh, we don't we don't want to make word. it we don't want to make it bigger than Ben Hur and, yeah. and hugely complicated. Bearing in mind many of these classes are run by older people themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is about a strength and balance approval tick, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it's an approved program. You know that it's going to be based on these criteria and the lead agencies will be supporting community providers to make sure that they're keeping those programs um, uh, to those criteria over time. Um, it's not a formal accreditation, but you can be assured that they, they are approved and effective. Great. Thank you for that. Have ACC considered funding safe footwear? Now, that's a very good question. You, you can actually get some safe slippers with very good uh, solid soles made. Do you know if they're funded, Chanka? No, I'm a little bit not uh, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, I think if they are in the hospital, you right. know, I think the 
somebody comes into the hospital with a fall yes and then if the occupational therapist assesses the patient and then okay. they are recommended the hospital might certainly in Middlemore yes you know if somebody comes in with the current falls we provide hip protectors uh, from the hospital yes the do they provide the slippers and the shoes no, well not to my knowledge no okay uh, I think, it's know, a good question though yeah. because and I do know that many families are interested in safe footwear and there are good footwear mm. outlets for older people mm. so it's important and I don't expect ACC to fund everything, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I keep saying it because I think it's really important that all these um, things on an individual basis, um, you know, may, may be appropriate. But if we're actually going to achieve a reduction in falls and risk of falling at a population level, it's actually access to strength and balance and bisphosphonates. That are going to make the difference so yeah. um mm -hmm. yes or on an individual basis some of these things may be useful but if you draw on the research evidence we know that it's exercise that's the winner and if we can actually get people into these exercise programs on mass then we're going to make a big difference in new zealand now there seems to be quite an ongoing confusion about dexas so let's just go over it again if the person is over 75 and has had a fragility fracture Straight on bisphosphonates, no need for a DEXA. So the, the reason for that, Nari, is that, you know, we can assume that these patients have got osteoporosis. There have been plenty mm -hmm. of studies which have been done, mm -hmm. uh, DEXA scan on these patients, and all of them have osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason we actually lobbied to PharmaC and said, well, we don't need to do a DEXA scan for these patients over mm -hmm. the age of 75. So that is in the criteria. Okay. If they're over 75, if they've had a fragility fracture, they don't have a yeah, So the okay. vocationally registered GP can uh, apply uh -huh. for the bisphosphonates. Okay. And also specialists can do that as well. Okay. So it can be done. For under uh, 75 year olds, um, then we need to be looking at doing a DEXA scan okay. uh, for these patients. And can that be funded by the DHB or does the patient need to pay for that? Uh, well, most of the DHBs now, like for countries, Monaco, you know, we've got our own DEXA machine, so yes. GPs can freely refer patients for DEXA. Okay. We've been doing this for 13 years now. Okay. And most of the DHBs have got arrangements with the private DEXA provider for the patients. That is what the fracture liaison service is about. Okay. So the fracture liaison service will identify these patients over the age of 15. Yes. That is what we are asking them to do. Yes. And then they have an arrangement with the local DEXA provider to have the DEXA done. So that is between the DHB and the DEXA. Okay. So and, and then we have sometimes when ACC will so if, DEXA. If, if, a, if a person has got a, an ACC covered claim, yep. then ACC will pay for the cost of the DEXA scan. Okay. Okay. So if they've had a fall. And the criteria for that are clear in the, in the osteoporosis, osteoporosis guidelines. They have to okay. have a covered claim for a fragility fracture. Okay. Oh, for a fragility fracture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Phew. Okay, we've got one more case. I'm keeping an eye on the questions. Well, we're getting through them, but we we might not have time for all of them. Okay, now this is my favourite patient, Dorothy. Yeah. Now she talked for quite a long time on the uh, on the videotape with with Tana about her fall, and then at the end, Tana just quietly said, "Well, now how old are you, Dorothy?" And Dorothy is 93, and she is living alone. So she bent over to feed the cat. Now she's quite clear that the cat had nothing to do with the fall. Um, so no, she didn't want anyone to take her cat away. But she was feeding the cat. She twisted and fell to the side and she had her medical alarm on. And so she pushed her alarm and let uh, the St. John's know. However, it took them quite a long time to come, two and a half hours. Um, somebody else was let know in the meantime, and her daughter came round to um, look after her in the interim. And Joan had had a, sorry, Dorothy had had a hip fracture. So, 93, living alone, hip fracture. At the time the videotape was taken at the County's Manukau launch, she was six weeks post op and she was looking pretty good, wasn't yeah, she? Excellent. So, she rehabilitated very well. Hmm. So, tell us about the hip fracture registry and how will yeah. the hip fracture registry help? Dorothy. Okay, so um, as a trans Tasman initiator, we've been working on the hip fracture registry for oh, six years now. And the whole idea about the hip fracture registry is how to improve the outcomes for patients with hip fracture who get admitted to the hospital. So as I talked about earlier, we've got seven standards. So we want to 
how we can get the patients early uh, to the emergency department when a patient you know, with a hip fracture, and then how we can manage the pain. So that is a standard. So we need to manage the pain when they come into the emergency department. Mm -hmm. How we get them uh, to operating theater quickly within 48 hours, that is a criteria. And there is a new study which is going to come out soon. It's called the hip attack, uh, which is mm. being uh, done at the moment. And I think that might show that we need to get these patients operated within four hours. So wow, that is, that four is, hours. It's getting like stroke. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, th that is not that doesn't come out yet. But okay. the current standard is that we need to get these patients into theatre within forty eight hours. If we mm. get them operated early, then we actually uh, make the recovery faster for these patients as well, because they don't get into complications with okay. pneumonia and dehydration and all those things. Uh, and then the next uh, the standard would be uh, these patients need to be assessed by a geriatrician or somebody who's got some training in geriatric medicine, even a nurse specialist, you know, we haven't got access to uh, geriatricians. So that is a standard. So there would be a holistic approach for these patients looking at how we can reduce medications. Uh, starting them on bisphosphonates to prevent the next fracture mm -hmm. and then giving information to the patient and also the primary carer about what these patients have gone through with the rehabilitation, having rehabilitation available for these patients, uh, both in the hospital and in the community. And uh, SEC is doing some good work uh, on the topic with the case mix funding model, which Jill may want to talk about a bit later. Uh, and then also, um, you know, uh, getting them onto an exercise program as well, you know, uh, making sure that yes. these patients should be yeah. either an in-home program or a group yeah. exercise program. So that is what the fracture registry is about. Okay. So we've got 13 DHBs who are putting data into the hip fracture registry at the moment, yep. and they're hoping to get the, uh, the rest of the seven DHBs before the end of the year. And we're also looking at uh, displaying these outcome standards in the outcomes dashboard, which Jill was talking about, okay. which is going to come through next year as well. Okay, well, this sounds great. Now, with Dorothy, I also find that it's very important to keep encouraging her. Mm. Own less than a half of people regain the same functional level mm. after a hip fracture within a year. Yeah. Um, and so getting everybody around her to keep her doing her exercises and keep her active, this Dorothy was doing very well, obviously, because she was out of the house by six weeks and attending things. Let's hope it's like that for everybody. Mm. Now, we've got some other good questions here and a nice reminder that there's a podcast on the Goodfellow website about the phosphonates yeah. with, a, uh, with a review attached. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. What are the critical success factors enable, in enabling a locally driven falls and fractures system? This is a good question because all around New Zealand, the same emphasis is going to be on hip fracture registry, exercise classes for falls prevention, hooking up the community and the hospital. What are the things that really make it work? I don't think we can answer this one, but we'll discuss it. Yeah, well, look, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's I think it's important to say that it's it's still early days in, in many areas, bringing the, the, the whole system together, if you like, both from a, a primary care and secondary and also um, community exercise providers. But there's some really good examples out there where um, services are, are readily available and I think about the um, Canterbury model and, and, and the emerging models in, in, in counties and other areas where there's a real strong um, community and in-home focus. Um, the main thing I think is, is um, you know, obviously the obvious things about being connected. Um, uh, I think also this um, interpreting the evidence in terms of those things that are population-based interventions versus or alongside one-on-one uh, -on -one care. And I think what this initiative is, is about is reach, reaching the masses where we know that um, you know, strength and balance exercise will make a, a big difference. And I also think good communication. I've always thought that things work best in small towns where everybody knows each other. Mm -hmm. And so uh, finding out who to call and where to go seems to be straightforward. We need to work hard in our big cities to make sure that the community programs are known about, where to find them, that the falls liaise, falls and fracture liaison people do know the GPs and the GPs know them. So I think it's about communication and all working together. I agree totally. And I think we need to have the other organisation. Like St John's is a key player yes. in here. And I think they should be a part of the local falls working group. 
-hmm. And I think what we need to do is, uh, I think once we've got the primary care referring patients, we should be getting the community referring patients into these programs as can, well. Can you refer yourself? Can I refer Absolutely. my neighbor? Yes. Absolutely. Great. Yes. I think that is what we need to be looking yeah. at, you know, okay. like the local churches, you know, yep. pharmacies, you know, if they've got patients, you know, like somebody coming into the um, hairdresser, for example, and they've got difficulty <laughs> getting up. They should be referring patients yes. into these programs as well. As Jill talked about, you know, we need to have in mass patients into these programs. Yeah. I think that is what the future is. I think one of the things that Muriel has said to us and the, the older people that we have spoken to is that it can be confusing. And that's why we've created this unifying brand, Live Stronger for Longer. And we're encouraging all the uh, partners, whether it be the DHBs, primary, primary care, um, community providers to use that branding and use the tick so it's a connecting a unifying image that really connects people into this work and again that we hope that that will support more and more people being connected great so another good question here is um, what is the relationship between the home programs and the community programs and the Otago exercise program. Now I'll give you my view and you can correct me if I'm wrong. The in-home delivery will be the Otago exercise program or as close as it will be delivered by a physiotherapist so that's very close. The community programs are group programs and as you know the Otago exercise program was a one-on-one -on -one. but the exercises that have been credited given the tick um, uh, ver uh, incorporate the same exercises as the Otago exercise program, focusing on balance and lower leg strengthening. So equivalent, but not exactly the same. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Are they up and running now? Um, yes, there are. On, on most parts of the country, there are um, uh, programs in place. We, uh, we're we just, I think it, over the next couple of months, you'll start to see more and more come online as, as the lead agencies start to approve uh, programs. Um, but in many areas, there, there have been programs for a long time. And what we're trying to do is to uh, connect people in through the, the tick and the Live Stronger branding so that we can actually draw all these programs together so that you've got more choice of and consumers absolutely have more choice about where they can go to exercise and know that it will be uh, focusing so uh, on strength and balance so I think over the next couple of months um, pretty much all over the country there will be programs in in certain areas should, there should, are should we show them that website yeah, there are we into? Yeah. there are uh, places that are further on than others but if you go to the um, Live Stronger website. And I'll now just, we might mess this up, but we'll do our best. I'll just um, show you here. So this is the Live Stronger website, and it's largely so, primarily so. for consumers. And there's a number of tabs you'll see here. Mm -hmm. um, under this Stay Stronger for Longer tab, you'll see access to find a class near you. And this is where consumers can go in and pick the area that they're in, and they'll find the contact of the the lead agency mm. who's growing access to those community class programs and they're the key to contact for those programs um, so that that would you, you could also click onto that if you want and after today's symposium I'll make sure it actually links into uh, where it says here about if you're a service provider I've just realized it's not there so this is where there's all the provider resources um, and you'll see a connection to all the uh, uh, guidelines and tests and things that we've been talking about and some of the other resources. So these your guideline for the tug. And so the tug, is it 12 seconds? 12 seconds. 12 yeah. seconds. Okay, so some of the literature is 10 or 15, but it's 12, 12 minutes. That is what the commission, you know. What the, the commission decided. Oh, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so that's really useful. So that website is simply called Live stronger.org.nz correct and if you just put live stronger and not and it'll find it and if you want to connect into um you know if you want to connect in fracture liaison or the in-home program then um those service providers in your area will be making connection with you or it should be do well documented in yes. false pathways i know it's <coughs> not um you know, it's it's different all over the country, and that's quite deliberate. We mm. have, have not, ACC's not got involved in that local decision making about how these services should be structured. That's a local decision, um, but just to say that they they will be available and uh, we.
reach out to um, yeah. your colleagues to find out more about what's happening locally for you. Now, I think we all have to be quite innovative in this way. There's a question here about whether transport is funded. Probably not. Uh, not, uh, not explicitly. Not explicitly, no, okay. but there may be something that's working in a local area. What we're looking for, as I said at the beginning, is um, in order to sustain um, programs to meet the population need, you know, they have to be com community low cost. Um, one of the um, requirements for the lead agencies is that they um, draw in as many programs as they can that are accessible to uh, many groups. So we'll be working with, they will be working with, um, you know, uh, residential homes, with gyms, with age concern, with uh, various classes that are already in existence to um, bring them up to those, um, the, the strength and balance approval tick, if you like. Okay, great. Um, now, another question about Tai Chi and yoga. Now, that's a good question. Tai Chi is effective in uh, false prevention. In fact, one of the cases uh, Bernadette, once she had recovered and had some strengthening, actually managed to get out to a Tai Chi class. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> they are also effective and available. Yoga is flexibility and concentration, not so much false prevention, is still beneficial in many, many other ways. I guess one other thing we haven't talked about is how you choose whether somebody gets an in-home program or the community program. And I think the benefit of attending a class and getting out of the house and meeting other people, the benefits are greater than just the exercise. So if people are able to get out, they should really be going to the community classes. Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, um, from the evidence from the Canterbury model, about 4% of your local population would come under the, the frailty age group and they would benefit yes. from the in-home exercise program and the rest should be attending the community program. Yeah. So most of the patients you know who would see in the primary care yeah. should be attending the community program if they're yeah. able to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now is a comment here from somebody that their mother took seven days to get their hip operation. Oh, well, hip operation. <laughs> and, and that is what this hip fracture registry is about. Okay. So um, I think certainly, you know, I can talk from the counties. Like four years ago, you know, about 60% of, of our patients with fractures had the surgery done within 48 hours. Now it stands at 85%. So I think, you know, what we are trying to do is we'll be displaying these standards in the National Outcomes Dashboard come next year. And th this will be open and transparent. And I think, you know, people will be able to see it. And yeah. uh, if, you know, people are not achieving that more than 80% target, then they should be questioning, you know, why it's not happening. Yeah. Uh, so so, not... so that person should write to the DHB. Yeah, most certainly. <laughs> yeah, agree. Okay. Yeah. We'll have yeah. a riot. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's a good case. How would you manage a 60-year-old woman who is reasonably fit and well, who is worried about her family history of fr fragility fractures with a sibling being on Fosamex? When would you do a DEXA or would it, would it be warranted? So 60 years old, family history, yeah. worried. Well, once again, if you look at the osteoporosis guidance, you know, we've gone through the risk factors. So let me just go through this. Right. So if the age is more than 65. No, she's only 60. 60. So yeah. that, that is a risk factor. So if yeah. over 65 is a risk yeah. factor for women yeah. and over 75 for men. If the uh, BMI is less than 20, okay, so that skinny. is a risk factor. Yes. So if they are thin, then yes. obviously that we should be worried about mm -hmm. osteoporosis. <laughs> if there is a family history of osteoporosis. She's got that. Especially if there is a maternal history of hip fracture. Uh -huh. So okay. there is a very strong predictor that this, that this could be a family history. Mm -hmm. So that is an important risk factor. Smoking. So if she's okay. smoking. Or ex-smoker. Um, current smoking. Current first. smoking. That is a risk okay. factor. Yep. Uh, if she is on um, glucocorticoids, steroids, that is a risk factor, okay. obviously, for osteoporosis, current use, early menopause. Okay. So if she's at menopause, you know, uh, Pre below 45, 45 yep. then that is a risk factor. If she is drinking more than two alcoholic drinks daily, ooh, two, okay. more than two. <laughs> so that is a risk factor. If she's in a history of falls, then that is a risk factor. So she should be okay. worried about okay. 
rheumatoid arthritis. So if she's got yes. rheumatoid arthritis, then that is, you know, they would have okay. thin bones. So that would be a risk factor as well. They've got a history of eating disorders. Okay. So that is all very clear. And how many do you need? Um, any is one well, enough? Any. One is enough. You know, okay. I think we're not specifying that these, you know, yes. more than two or three. Okay. If you have, you know, some of these risk factors, even one, then you should be, you know, assessing these osteoporosis okay. using the guidelines. So for this so lady you, who's 60, yeah. she's got osteoporosis family history. Mm. So she has a has a risk factor. So, you know, in here it says no fracture. And if there is more than one, one risk, risk factor for osteoporosis, yeah. then you should do lifestyle modifications. Okay. And then you do a clinical risk assessment, which can be a BMD, yes. bone, uh, bone DEXA scan, yeah. or you do a fracture risk assessment. Okay. Which is so, the Garvin or the Frax, Garvin which the is Frax. in there as well. Yeah. yeah. So, and then depending on that, then you go through that pathway to yeah. treating osteoporosis. So, it's quite possible that your 60 yeah. year old will um, end up being eligible for a DEXA and therefore yeah. osteoporosis treatment if she is at high risk. Yeah. So, I think that's very good. Um, okay. So, if um, access to a class was a significant Limitation, would ACC consider funding transport if they had a claim related to a fall or a fragile fracture? No, there's no mechanism for that. Okay, so I think we have to re let communities also demonstrate some social capital, which means often there is a community bus. Most people have a gold card for public transport if there is public transport in the town. Yeah. yeah. And tricky, if, if they have I, difficulty, you know, accessing class, then I think the, the DHB might consider um, doing an in-home program. Uh, do you think? Or, or, I mean, that, that 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 might be the case, and I think that that needs to be a local, clinically yeah. driven decision. Yes, um, it's not. I mean, if if the person has an ACC claim and um, ACC is working with that person to improve their mobility and exercise. There may be other services that they're receiving anyway, which um, could yeah. be community physio and the like, of which transport is likely to be um, part of that. Uh -huh. But I think, you know, as, as Nairi said, and, and as what we're trying to achieve here is access to classes, access to strength and balance on mass, on scale. So yeah. it has to be easy, it has to be local, it has to be um, accessible within the community and that's what we're working with yeah. local health systems to yeah. achieve. Yeah. And this is, um, you know, it's very much a partnership here. ACC is making a contribution. Yes, it's it's significant right now, but it is just a contribution. Um, and this is about us all working together to actually do better by older people. And now to make this referral, really, there's not a formal referral process. You don't need to write a, a referral to the class. Mere, um, um, identify the class with the older person and give them the contact details. Is that sufficient? Yeah, I mean, it will vary within each locality. So okay. I would encourage people to connect in with the, oh. the lead agency or their local falls uh, working group team, um, the usual people that they talk to about um, force prevention in that area and there'll be something quite specific but the idea of the um, certainly the class programs is as Shankar said is that they're accessible to everybody and we can um, that has a risk of falls um, and and a strength and balance problem so you know the hairdresser can refer the person can refer themselves you mm. you know family members can refer it's it's a meant to be low low um, uh, barriers to access Right. So um, a few more questions about the processes of uh, the classes. In Counties Manukau, is there in-home classes available now? So what we're doing in counties is a population-based approach. So, okay. so we are um, getting the practices in counties Manukau, um, identifying all patients over the age of 75 in their practice. They know uh, who they are. Practice. Yeah, so <laughs> they do. And then Maoris and Pacific Islanders over the age of 65 who've had an ACC claim. Okay. So that would be done by the receptionist who will actually, uh, the practice manager will identify the list of patients. Yeah. And then the receptionist will give a ring to the patient and then ask those three questions. Mm -hmm. And then if the answer is yes, when they come in for the, uh, you know, the usual prescription collection or when they come into the practice, the nurse will do a simple, the two tests, the okay. time up and go, yeah. and the, the tandem test, the balance yes. test. Yeah. And if it is positive, 
then the criteria is that if they've got a personal care package and also if they've got a mobility aid, yes, then they would be referred to the in-home program. So okay. there is, we are developing a strength and balance template, okay. like a e-referral template. So that so means all that Countess the, Manicale comes through your general practice for yes. the in-home services? Yes, so that is the phase program. one. So yep. that is phase one. Yep. And then next year, what we're looking at is we are looking at uh, secondary care services like the hospital and the St. John's referring these patients directly to these exercise programs. Yep. And then phase three from 2019, we are looking at community pharmacies, yep. churches, okay. all the okay. self reforms happening. So we are doing yep. it in phases in countries. Yep. And we also have some very good feedback about re the reablement process, which is yeah. through the community packages and the support services. Yeah. Um, this is different than reablement, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is a population-based, you know, exercise program we're offering in counties, and reablement is mainly for patients, you know, who are either in the primary care or in the community or in secondary care yes. who are recovering from an illness, and you provide, yes. you know, intervention for a few weeks. So that is sort of a rehabilitation program or yes. ability to independence yeah. program. Yeah. So that is different from what we are talking about. Right. Okay. Great. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, uh, who trains the community exercise class instructors? <laughs> so the, le the lead agencies are, um, that's part of their role to support um community providers, whoever they may be, to um, deliver these programs. I mean, many of these programs happen already. Um, willing volunteers and, that and are supported by um, uh, sports trusts or Age Concern or, um, you know, other organisations. So it's, it's uh, remember that these are um, simple, uh, straightforward exercises. It's not, they're not complicated, they're not technical. They um, largely can be delivered by older people themselves. That's where the evidence is, and that's what we're trying to encourage. But the lead agencies will support providers and support uh, training where that's uh, necessary. Now, there's a comment here that on Waiheke, there is no lead agency or lead provider. Should they be tying into the Auckland District Health Board, I guess? Yes, I guess. Well, Hickey comes into Auckland HB. comes into Auckland HB. We've got somebody here I'll who's keen, sure. yeah, who's no, keen to, to well, uh, help I'll, that process. I'll make sure that um, it's Harbour uh, Har Sport. Harbour Sport that are the lead agency in the Auckland region. Okay. Um, so they would have the, the connection there. Um, and I can either pass that contact on or it's on the website. Okay, now this is a good question. Are there any disparities or inequalities, inequities noticed in the incidence of fragility fractures or outcome for specific communities, either geographical or ethnicity related? You, I know. You'd be the best person to ask that, Nari. You've done the so, study. Yes. So um, <laughs> we do know that uh, for Māori and also Pacific bones are stronger and lean body mass is greater and fractures are less common. Uh, in each specific age group. We know that people who have uh, had a high alcohol use and uh, those osteoporosis risk factors, uh, lots of smoking tend to be in the lower socioeconomic areas and fractures are socioeconomically, um, uh, there is a disparity by socioeconomic. So yes, there are disparities, but this is one of the good stories for Māori and Pacific where they lead um, Pākehā. Yeah. So our, our, the thin, older Pākehā women are at the highest risk and they're the, uh, the highest. Now maybe St John's shuttle could assist with transport to classes. Well, I think there are some areas in South Island. St John's is doing some transport. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. aware of local, you yeah. know, local variation, but um, yeah. the, 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 the maybe that. Maybe an option in your area. Um, the other thing that's been suggested to us is that there's many um, residential home buses that are uh, lie idle for parts of the day, and they might be rallied into uh, uh, supporting people get to to exercise programs. Um, okay, so um, this is a good question too about the risk of jaw necrosis with Fosamax. Mm. Before starting, should they have all? Should people have their dental work done beforehand, 
or maybe we could talk about the risk of yeah. that. Um, osteonecrosis of the jaw um, has been really overrated and I think you know what we saw was these patients you know who have been having high doses of risk management for cancer patients we are talking about um, but we haven't really seen patients you know who are taking medications bisphosphonates for osteoporosis as such okay. not very common so we're not recommending having a dental sort of workup before okay. commencing treatment certainly if you are you know treating a patient for cancer high doses then yes they need to yeah the other um, side effect which um, some um, general practitioners may be aware of is the atypical fracture which is we are okay. seeing more so which is uh, basically um, a fracture below the neck of femur okay uh, and this could be bisphosphonate related and we are seeing more of it and most of these patients, you know, would have a, like a stress fracture. They would have some aches and pains in that area. Mm -hmm. It is normally bilateral. So both hips, you know, uh, you have fracture at the same time. So if somebody was on uh, bisphosphonates, you know, complaining of aches and pains in that area, mm -hmm. you might want to think about it. Not very common. I have to reiterate that, you know, it's very, very uncommon, but we are seeing more of it. Uh, okay. So you need to keep it in mind, but we're not routinely recommending a dental sort of clearance before you okay. start treatment for osteoporosis. Okay. And so would you recommend withholding a few doses around the time of dental work? For oral fosamax? Yeah. No. No. No, no, no. Okay. So no, okay to just carry on. Yeah. Sure. Good. Yeah. Um, now my understanding is the 75 plus criteria for DEXs is universal, not just in Counties Manukau. So it's a national for program. The yeah. the criteria. Yep, national program. Yeah. So now age concern are rolling out SAGO programs and they do provide some transport sometimes and there's a small charge. Now is SAGO one of the tick? So SAGO um Certainly, the, in, down, Steady as you go. down in yes. Otago is um, based on the Otago exercise program and has been shown to be effective for a number of years. And what we're encouraging the lead agencies to do is to make contact with all the age concerns that provide exercise programs and um, bring them on board with the, with the tech and under the Live Stronger banner so that they are available. Great. And, and if there's... Um, support for transport with those programs then that's often a local a local okay. conversation great acc is not funding <laughs> exercise programs um we're we're funding the um coordination mm. to grow access to grow approved programs um it's quite different than the approach that we've taken before mm. and that's uh, about it being a uh, largely a sustainable program for us all to support but you are funding the in-home delivery. We're not. We're to making. Some a, we're making a contribution, contribution. to that yes. again. The, yes. the benefits of um, reducing the falls rate for over 75s will largely sit in in the health sector, um, but are absolutely be benefit to ACC in terms of um, claims, uh, costs, and, uh, and the like. But it's a, it's a contribution. It's a yep. real partnership approach, yep. um, and I think you know it. It absolutely should be celebrated as a as a new way of working. Yeah, and the totally contribution agree. is yeah. reasonably significant. So the DHBs and ACC are in in the in home delivery together. Absolutely, yeah. and, and yeah. actually, as well, many DHBs have been providing these yep. services for a number of years. ACC has is coming to the party to try and ensure that we have got national coverage and that we have got enough services to reach mm. as many people as we need to in order to meet the growing demands of the population. Um, now, um, this one's for you, um, Shankar. Is yep. there a way to prevent the flu reaction side effect of zalendronate? Um, and yep. currently, uh, currently recommend every 18 to 24 months infusion per guideline instead of annually. Is That's that right. right. Yes. So okay. the, the registered um, recommendation, according to the manufacturer, is yearly. But we know the uh, half-life of zoledronic acid mm -hmm. is 18 months, 24 hours, okay. and 24 months. So okay. it can be given either every 18 months or every two years, three doses. That's what we are recommending. Yep. Once again, the guideline for zoledronic acid infusion should be available in your local DHB. Mm -hmm. And what we are recommending is that you need to give a couple of paracetamol tablets half an hour before the infusion. Okay. And that reduces the flu type reaction. Okay. And that is in the guideline. That's pretty standard in all of these things. Okay. Yeah. So prevention is better than cure. Yeah. Yeah. Most certainly. Yeah. 
yeah. just some more comments coming back to enabling access with transport. I mean, this is something we need to keep discussing, mm. isn't it? With, yeah, and I think, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would encourage people to, to in, engage in the local conversations about transport and the availability of programs for mm. people in that community because we, the expectation is the lead agencies will work with the local community to make sure there is access in a in a variety of places to a variety of um, groups of people. So, um, and there may be local solutions to transport. Um, uh, ACC doesn't have all those solutions. Mm. And so it's likely that um, you know I think in every area that we all should be advocating for our patients and pushing the lead agencies and the DHBs and the falls prevention program to think about how to meet this yeah. need. Yeah. Oh, I agree with Jill. I think it is a community initiative, and I think the 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 idea about using the residential care providers, you know, the buses they have, the vans they have yeah. for the community programs, that is for the local, the lead provider to work with. I would yeah. Think. Right. Yeah. Um, and what about rural locations? Yeah. Again, all there's a lead agency in all um, areas, and um, you know, up in up in the East Cape and Gisborne, West Coast. Um, far north, there are lead agencies that are working with those communities to decide what to, to work out what's what's the best way to provide mm. um, services there. There may be some areas where um, you know it's not effective to have or not efficient to have a, a separate service, and that will be integrated with other other um, community programs. Things like pulmonary rehab, things like cardiac rehab. Um, all of these things can be integrated. The exercise and approach, um, you know, can be, um, are very similar. Um, obviously, there's some disease specific advice that needs to go with it, but the actual core exercises, um, you know, can be similar. So lots of innovation in terms of how we deliver, but the intent is they'll be right across the country. Um, okay, and just uh, there's a question that I don't know whether I can answer, and that was uh, we spoke about Māori and Pacific people having a lower fracture risk. What about Asian communities? And I think they're the same as Pākehā. Well, it is, and I think, you yeah. know, the same risk factors we talked about already yeah. applies. So, you know, if yeah. you've got thin build, low BMI, yeah. then I think the risk is high mm -hmm. in these patients. I think most of the Asians would fit into the category, uh -huh. I would think. Okay. So I think, you know, we just need to be looking at the same risk as a parking lot. And I, I, just yeah. a, one comment from me. Once we do have the um, online dashboard available to look at outcomes across the country and across each DHB district, you'll be able to look by um, ethnic group about what's happening in terms of rates of falls, fractures, hospital admission due to falls. We'll all be able to be done on the, on the ethnic groups. Okay, so for how long will ACC assist with funding? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do know that there's been many things going around, but I understand this is a long-term commitment. So ACC's um, recent investment case was a commitment to invest just over 30 million for three years across the country, and that's in the range of things that we've been talking about today. And we've also signalled in that business case that we would work with our health sector partners, so the planning and funding folk at, at, at DHB level, to um, look at future funding beyond that three-year period. We signalled that it's likely that ACC will continue to support force prevention if we can get um, a good demonstration of outcomes, which there really is no reason why we shouldn't at that this level of uh, uh, enthusiasm and support for these programs. But the important thing is getting people into programs. ACC's commitment will not be at the 30 million beyond three years. It will be less than that. The expectation is um, that our DHB partners will continue to support these programs. And just, just to give an example about, you know, what, the commission has been doing for the last five years. You know, the commission has been focusing on preventing falls in the hospitals mainly with mm -hmm. the reducing harm from falls program. And over the last five years, you know, what we've done with the intervention, what we have. You know, now that's the done. Health Safety and Quality Commission. Yep. That's right. Yep. Health Quality and Safety Commission yep. with the reducing harm from falls program, which has been running for about five years now, focusing on how do you assess risk of fall in the patient in the hospital, older person, 
and then the marker we've been measuring is the hip fractures in the hospital. Okay. And we've reduced the hip fractures by 40% mm. in the last five years. Fantastic. So that's Great been a work. good outcome. I think we want a similar thing with this program yes. for patients, you know, reducing admissions to emergency department with falls mm. and also fractures with this program. Mm. So I think that is what we'll be focusing on with this outcomes dashboard. So there, there would be savings for the DHB with those reductions, you know, in uh, to the presentations to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now where do, they, where do we find the guidelines? Could we put them on the screen? The osteoporosis guidelines. Uh, osteoporosis New Zealand. So well, while well, Jill's just finding them there, I'll ask the next no. question, which is, are all the phosphonates created equal? Uh, how would you choose between resedronate, aledronate, and zoledronate? All equal. All the same. All the same. Resedronate, you don't need to um, apply for a special authority. You know, uh, you can prescribe it from the community. Okay. So all equal. Um, so you can start uh, resedronate for your patient in the community. Okay. So the the only thing about the oral alendronate or the residronate is the compliance issue. So yep. you know you need to make sure that you need to have the tablet on an empty stomach with one glass of water, and you need to sit upright for yes. about thirty minutes. Yep. And I think the compliance rate falls. I think about thirty percent of the patients don't take this because of the restrictions. What we're talking about. Yep. So to give the IV zoledronic acid is much easier. So yep. to give it every two years, three doses is much easier. Yeah. All of the same. So again, the osteoporosis guidance talks about other medications. So we do have uh, the teriparatide, which is a subcutaneous injection, which is a parathyroid hormone derivative, which is an anabolic agent. And that one is for patients, you know, who get recurrent fractures. While they're on, on bisphosphonates. Right. So we should be contacting the specialists exactly. about that. Exactly. That's right. Yep. So if you have patients okay. like this, you need to be referring these patients to your local specialist service, yep. endocrinology or your osteoporosis service who will be recommending these medications for you. Yeah, that's right. Once again, all these things are in the osteoporosis yep. guidance. Yep. No, that sounds great. Now, the... Um, <clears throat> Will ACC be monitoring the lead providers? <laughs> um, so monitoring's a bad, difficult word, isn't it? Maybe um, so supporting the, the whole. Um, this whole initiative is all about working together, um, and each um, DHB district um, has a, either a, a well-established um, group that is focused on health of older people, which includes fall prevention. Or through this work that we've been working over the last year or so, have created a local falls working group of which the lead agency is part, and and it's up to that local health system to drive a focus on outcomes and on 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 delivery of um, effective um, outcomes for older people. ACC happens to have the commercial agreements, if you like, with the lead agencies, so there are requirements that we expect. Um, from those lead agencies around making sure that, that, that there are a certain number of places um, available for older people in each DHB district. We, ACC, is part of those local force working groups, so we'll be having a collective conversation about what's working, what's not working, and how we can uh, make improvements for that, for that for that health system. If that um, equates to sort of monitoring, then yes, we will be <laughs> we'll be working with everybody to make sure we're all <laughs> being monitored and monitoring each other. I guess. Um, what's important is that that all the all the sort of targets around outcomes and uh, targets around get throughput through services have been based on uh, population projections for each DHB district, um, and it's our you know, best guess on the current rates of falls and fractures and based on population growth. Um, of course, until we get into this, it's, um, you know, we, we, we've got to see how we go. Those targets about throughput and the reason why there's this intensity around getting people into programs is that we know that that's the big, strong, strongest early indicator that we're being effective. And if we're being effective, then we're likely to be able to collectively invest um, into the future. It's all about getting the outcomes for older folk. And so I think, please, everybody put up your last questions. We're thinking it's nine o'clock and we yep. know you'll be drifting off. 
Um, but put uh, uh, put any last questions up, and we'll do our best. So uh, for the exercise programs, there is no age limit. It's related to the risk of the person. Yeah. So if they're frail with uh, mobility problems and have had a fall, then it doesn't matter what age they are. So they could be 65 or 70. Yeah, so I mean, the the, the program is, you know, over, over 65s, but also include those under 65 that have a risk of fall if that relates to um, any other uh, a, a group um, but really the target is for those over 65 we know that the rate of falls increase as you get over 65 um, and that increases dramatically over the age of 75 so in home is prime in, in home strength and balance primarily targeted at over 75s we expect about four percent of the population of over 75s to benefit from in home other than that, if you've got a risk of fall get that is related to a strength problem, get people into a strength and balance program. Don't not ignore the other factors, but if strength's <laughs> an issue, strength and balance is going to be a winner. So get them That's in there. Right. 30, yeah. 30, between 28 and 30 percent reduction in falls rates for people going through strength and balance programs. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Now, there's a good question here, too, which probably will be the last one. Are those with dementia welcome in the classes? Now, we talked a little bit about dementia earlier, but I see no reason why people with dementia should not go to the classes as long as they can tolerate it and enjoy it along with everybody else. Um, and that's a matter about the skill of the, uh, the tolerance of the people around them and the skill of the facilitator. Yeah. But they are welcome, yes. I absolutely yeah. agree, and there'll be, sure. there'll be specific sorts of pro programs that suit um, different people at different times and I think what we're asking is communities are able to provide a choice uh, for 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 their population um, there's no uh, uh, as Nairi says no no um, barrier to those people attending if they can attend okay now we um, there's just one last question I do apologize for missing it earlier are we aware of any research supporting the use of aquatic aquatic therapy as this can be the medium which addressed the fear of falls. Um, now that's a good question. Aquatic therapy and uh, certainly uh, water-based exercise is very good for endurance and for cardiovascular exercise. It's not actually weight-bearing though, so it's more difficult to argue that it's effective in um, falls prevention. Fear of falling is a very important factor that we haven't talked about, and that's about the person's confidence. And um, confidence may well be benefited by aquatic therapy, and that would be a good thing in itself. And I, I, I would agree with that. And I think we, we would say that aquatic therapy alongside um, um, a strength and balance program, but in order to uh, challenge balance and challenge, challenge uh, strength in a way that prevents falls, it has to be sort of land-based exercise. Okay. So I think we're going to wrap up. I'd like to thank you all for um, coming to the webinar and thank anybody who wants to watch it later. Do remember the bisphosphonate podcast on the, uh, on the Goodfellow website. And remember our main messages, which were well, my main messages, be good to your older people. Keep doing the good job that you're doing with uh, looking after um, their many different problems. Falls prevention has got to become higher in the awareness now as our dem demography is aging. There's new things coming along from ACC. There's good things coming along with fracture prevention and uh, liaison groups. And um, so let's all be aware of them and utilise them as much as we can. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll leave the last word to Jill from ACC. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> <Very good job. laughs> Well, thank, thanks everyone for your time this evening. Thanks for listening. Nairi, Shankar, thank you for your uh, expertise and support. Um, and I would just uh, reiterate what Nairi said, really encourage you to get involved locally, look out for the Live Stronger uh, for Longer um, programs and, and get your patients in there. And if, if, the, if strength and balance is an issue, um, refer them in. Uh, and, 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 and let's uh, keep our older people well, well and safe at home. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shankar.